On defense investment, we will turn the corner and reverse the trend of declining defense budgets. NATO's leader said flat out before this morning's summit in Wales, Russia is attacking Ukraine. And Russia's foreign minister warned that Ukraine is asking for too much from the West. Charlie Daggett is following that battle of words from London. Charlie, good morning. Good morning. Whatever debate takes place today over NATO and its relationship with Ukraine, Russia's foreign minister launched a preemptive strike warning NATO leaders that any offering any kind of membership to Ukraine would be a blatant attempt to derail peace talks. It's not his summit, but Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko met with NATO leaders today, including President Obama, to update on the progress he's made, or not, with Russian President Vladimir Putin to end the conflict in Ukraine. Never one to be upstaged, Putin himself parlayed a state visit to Mongolia to present his own proposal. A simple seven-point peace plan, one he scribbled in a notebook on the flight over Siberia that includes that militias should cease military advances, exclude the use of combat aircraft against civilians, and prisoner captive exchange without preconditions. The plan doesn't address key issues like the separatist fighters loyal to Russia battling Ukrainian forces. NATO leader Anders Fogh Rasmussen said he welcomed any efforts to find peace, but what counts is what's happening on the ground. We continue to call on Russia to pull back its troops from Ukrainian borders, stop the flow of weapons and fighters uh, into Ukraine, stop the support for um, armed militants uh, in uh, Ukraine. The Secretary General's accusation that Russia is attacking Ukraine set the tone for today's talks. Moscow denies its troops are there, but NATO says there are more than a thousand soldiers operating inside the country. Gail? All right, Charlie, thank you. In case of bombings in major cities, there will be an influx of over a million new refugees. We are ready to handle the refugee crisis, but it seems difficult due to approaching winter. Temporary accommodations need to be equipped with heating systems. Refugees themselves do a great job. They don't sit idle and look for work. Meanwhile, Ukrainian refugees have met in Sakhalin. Specialized Russian aviation delivered migrants to different places of their future habitation. Those who fled from the war are being provided with medical care, food, housing and employment. Russian migration services are set to work with refugees to help execute necessary documents in order to provide them official status. In some places, temporary asylum and nationality quarters have come to an end. People are being asked to move to other cities. The main purpose is to help them find employment and get their children registered in schools. So, in terms of the situation in uh, the general, it's far more, far more serious. So, initially, uh, President uh, Yanukovych uh, delayed the signing of the association agreements with uh, the EU because he thought that the document needed more elaboration. And uh, are you partners relying on uh, radical extreme elements stage a coup? They toppled uh, the authorities. And whatever they say, and of course we realize they, we're no fools. We saw those uh, biscuits handed out at Maidan. Uh, by U.S. authorities. That involves, of course, the U.S. and the EU, and uh, they are implicated in this unconstitutional or forceful regime change. And so the part of the country that didn't agree with that is now suppressed with uh, uh, air force, tanks, artillery, multiple launch rocket systems. If these what they call the modern European values, I am deeply disappointed. We have had multiple contacts with Ukraine, the EU, the US. We told them you need to stop this fratricidal war, you need to get down to the negotiations table. 
So if you look at uh, Ukraine's proposals uh, about three weeks ago, they said we stopped uh, our uh, we stopped hostilities within seven days, but uh, if you don't lay down your arms, uh, you will be destroyed. So people actually didn't buy that. They took up uh, weapons because they had to defend themselves, so they didn't agree to those uh, uh, conditions. And hostilities resumed, and now we see that big cities and small towns alike are encircled by the Ukrainian army, which... Uh, take direct hits uh, at residential quarters to destroy the vital infrastructure, to suppress the will of those who resist them. Of course, it's uh, very sad, but it reminds me of World War II when German forces encircled Russian cities like Leningrad. You are from St. Petersburg, right? So they encircled St. Petersburg and uh, hit uh, residential quarters uh, with heavy artillery. And the Nevsky Avenue still have uh, the sign, beware during an artillery attack, this part of the street is the most dangerous. But there's still a sign that re remains on the, one of the walls on Nevsky Avenue. So these people have attempted, so why they call this a military humanitarian operation? They want to push back uh, these uh, multiple launch rocket systems uh, for, of Ukrainian authorities from big cities. So, should they be not allowed to do that? Should they just allow civilians to be killed? The position of our partners is as follows, at least I understand it this way. You need to get to the negotiation table, but you just need to give the Ukrainian authorities some time for, uh, for fire, you know, to shell the cities. But it won't work out. You need to force the Ukrainian authorities to get down to the negotiation table, and not just on technical issues like an exchange of uh, POWs. Well, Mr. Lavrov came to you, and uh, diplomats like to use the word substantive. So you have to launch substantive negotiations. You have to understand what kind of rights uh, will the people of Donbass and Lugansk have. Of course, uh, we need to stick to to modern civilized rules, and you have to ensure these the rights of these people. So this should be the focus, this should be on the agenda, and then it will be pretty easy to resolve for border issues, security issues. It's very important to agree on the essence, but they don't want to do that, that's the problem. Well, Russia united, and how all the parties united, uh, in the situation of Crimea, everyone realized that we are on the right path. We need... Well, Crimea was illegally handed over to Ukraine. Why illegally? Because even according to the Soviet laws, the Supreme Soviet Council needed to give its go-ahead, but it's the Presidium of the Communist Party that took that decision. So we also needed to restore this historical justice. We need to protect uh, the people who reside there. Now, if you look at uh, the incidents in Odessa, in Lugansk, in Donetsk, we all understand what could have happened back in Crimea. We didn't just grab it. We've allowed the residents of Crimea to take their decision, to voice their decisions, and so we just accepted it. It all united us, including opposition parties who are very critical towards uh, the authorities. They will try to attack the forces of the militia. I believe this is a a dangerous, a fatal mistake which would lead to heavy casualties. I think it's just the West thinking that they need to, you know, to play in some war. So this is a serious tragedy, a clash that we are witnessing in Ukraine. Of course, there are people 
here, present here, who have their own view on history, and you might argue with my view, but Ukrainians and Russians are, largely speaking, one of the same nation. Well, of course, uh, you might say I'm wrong. Well, initially, we didn't have a Russian nation. We just had tribes, Slavic tribes, 16 or 32. But uh, after uh, the baptization of uh, Rus, uh, which then gave rise uh, to uh, uh, Russia, and as uh, you know, it all first happened... Uh, in Hersenes, and that's why Crimea is so sacred to us. But initially the Russian nation was born out of many ethnicities. And of course, the people who live around Kiev, they have always called themselves Russians. And there are, of course, some of the parts uh, in Galicia, which are close to Western Europe, and of course they've uh, built uh, their specific ties with the Catholic world. Of course there was a lot of penetration of languages and cultures, but they shouldn't impose their views and values on the whole of the Ukrainian nation. So I believe what is happening at the moment in Ukraine, it's a common tragedy, and we need to do everything to make sure that we stop it. Historical memory is a very important component of our culture, our history, our lives today. And of course we should also consider the future based on our historical experience and our historical memory. So I can tell you straight away that Russia is far from being involved in large-scale conflicts. We don't want that and we are not going to do that. Of course we should always be ready to repel any aggression, any attack on Russia, regardless of the situation uh, our partners' nations are in, they should always realize that they would be better off not messing with us, uh, talking about the possible military conflict, but uh, thankfully I don't think anybody seriously considers the possibility of starting a military conflict with Russia. I would like to remind you that Russia is one of the biggest nuclear powers. Uh, these are not just words, this is real, and uh, we actually strengthen our nuclear forces. They are more compact now, but they're also more efficient. They are more modern. They have modern weaponry. And uh, we continue to boost their potential, and we are going to do this in the future as well. This is not to threaten anybody, this is just for us to feel protected and be able to implement our economic and social plans.